Great. Okay, uh, so our next presenter is a software engineer at Google who's been at Google for five years and has worked on things like uh, maps, apps, ads, and open source at Google. He also apparently makes a mean martini. Uh, could you please welcome Daniel Nadasi, who is talking about AngularJS. Okay, um, hi everyone. Uh, I'm Daniel Nadasi. Um, oh, there we go. Okay. Uh, so, uh, Chris has given me a bit of an intro. Uh, I don't have too much to say aside from that. I, I work nowadays mostly kind of split between um, a bit of front end stuff and a bit of back end stuff, which is pretty common for Google. Um, and as part of that, in the last five years, I've encountered uh, a fair number of different uh, web development uh, technologies and so on, um, many of which are sort of unique to Google in some sense. Um, AngularJS is a bit of a new one. Um, it was released uh, uh, v1 June last year, though it was open source for a bit before that. Um, and so I wanted to give a bit of an idea of you know, the latest trends in web technologies and uh, sort of the web development ecosystem, and then also just say a bit about AngularJS, the niche it fills, uh, what it's good for, and why I'm ex excited about it. So. Most of you who've done any web programming at all or even just hacked up websites will know that jQuery is kind of your port of call for almost absolutely everything. Uh, you know, there's the jQuery UI models if you want to, you know, just throw pre-made widgets onto your website. Um, it's got a whole bunch of DOM manipulation stuff, which is amazing. And, you know, it, it's really got kind of the gamut of uh, functionality that you could uh, need. And this is, you know, as true to get today as it was two years ago and so on, and not really much has changed in that department. Uh, so I'm not going to talk about jQuery because everyone probably already knows jQuery. Um, the next thing is mobile is absolutely huge. Like anyone who's been paying attention to the internet over the last few years has seen that mobile is kind of growing at this exponential pace. Uh, now, in, at Google, I work on business products, so we've got a slightly different focus, and most of my work is not done on mobile. But any of you who are building consumer-targeted uh, products that you know, uh, uh, people want to use day to day, mobile is a huge part of that story now. And you see things like you know, uh, Africa as an entire continent is basically entirely based on mobile, and that seems to be the way they're headed. Um, so naturally, you get a bunch of these mobile development frameworks. Um, so jQuery Mobile is kind of the obvious one because jQuery is the obvious web development framework. You have uh, mobile devel development frameworks for mobile web apps. Um, it's of course worth mentioning that there's uh, that native mobile apps kind of throw a curveball into this whole ecosystem. But you know, let's not go in, go there. Um, there's a huge number of these, these mobile uh, sort of frameworks. They're, they are really exploding. Um, I won't go into a, a detail on a lot of them. There's some very interesting ones. There's some ones which are kind of trying to do various unique and, and interesting things. There's some that have UI components. There's others that have just focused on you know, having utility functions and things like that. So it's quite a cool um, little ecosystem that's developing. And there's a lot of interesting stuff. Um, it just takes uh, you know, a quick Google search and you know, you'll, the first few pages that pop up are uh, your, the best 10 uh, job, mobile JavaScript frameworks that are out there. So the one theme that kind of is extracted from all of these mobile frameworks is uh, two things. One is that they're small. Um, so you know you read through Zepto.js's documentation and it'll say you know the smallest JS web framework or something, something along these lines. And of course the rationale for this is obvious, which is you know when you're on a mobile um, in potentially uh, maybe a high bandwidth situation, maybe low bandwidth, but at, le at the very least high latency. You don't want to be making two connections, you know, too many connections, and you also want to try and minif uh, minimize the size of things because whatever you're doing, you're going to have less bandwidth probably than. Um, when you're on your desktop. So a lot of these things are advertising themselves on how small they can possibly be. And the other thing that they're advertising themselves on is how native they are. Um, so this is it, true in a very general sense, in the sense of some of them advertise themselves on how much like an iPhone they can look. Um, but other ones advertise, like an iPhone native app they can look. But other ones are advertising themselves on you know, how good their touch support is and things like that. So this is all very exciting. Um, 
AngularJS doesn't address any of this stuff. Um, <laughs> so browsers also still suck. Um, and part of the historical um, scene of uh, web development frameworks is to cover up cross-browser problems. Um, I know at Google we're trying our best not to support old versions of browsers, but you know, if you are in the situation of having to support IE6, for example, then having a web development framework that covers up for this is incredibly useful. Um, and the other thing is, and this is really where AngularJS comes in, um, a little bit to do with the cross-browser support, is that the frameworks that you're dealing with are progressively becoming more and more ambitious. So um, we don't really have, we, we still have all of these libraries, and to, to an extent this is what the, nice, the jQuery fills, that kind of give you this toolbox of things that you can use to build a website, like a, a UI widget or a, uh, you know, um, a, a util that, that does something nice um, or save you some code. Um, but then when, you, then when you start hitting Angular backbone knockout and that class of things, you start hitting these things that are actively trying to sort of rewire what you can do with web apps and make it so, you know, change the language that you're using to talk about these things. So they kind of end to end give you an actual uh, sort of template for, for how really nicely and easily without restricting the sort of expressiveness of the way you can do this. Um, Backbone and Knockout are both uh, very interesting in their own right, but uh, I have to pick one. And ultimately, I'm going to pick the one that's developed at Google. So <laughs> this, is, uh, this is where we come in. Oh, and one special mention, I love underscore JS. If you haven't used underscore JS, uh, I know there was a talk on functional programming earlier today, uh, which was really interesting. So if you're looking for JS support for just kind of functional constructs, underscore is this great little library that adds all of these different things into, uh, into JS. So you can sort of um, ma make all of these functional operations without having to think about it too hard. It's a really nice little library. Okay, so um, just I'll mention what we do, uh, or what I do on my team. So we built this thing called the Google Places for Business Bulk Upload Tool. Um, this is in, in amongst a, a few other things that, that the team does, but uh, uh, we sort of built this application for large businesses uh, to um, uh, to upload load like a large number of locations, you know, say you're McDonald's, you want your locations to appear on a map, you upload a spreadsheet containing a bunch of stuff, you, uh, we tell you that half of it's invalid and you can fix stuff in the browser. So um, it's a pretty typical example of something that's not trying to uh, change the world. Like it's, it's not your Google Maps or your um, sort of you're very, or maybe Google Docs, you're very involved web apps that require a lot of kind of hardcore wiring under the hood. Um, it's just an example of kind of a bear, like, a, you know, a meat and potatoes, like normal web app that you just want to throw together as quickly as possible and have quick feature changes and so on. I'll skip the demo in the interest of time. Um, and so why AngularJS? Well, actually, I, I won't start by talking about why we used AngularJS in the first place. I'll start talking about why we wanted to abandon the previous solution, which was GWT. Um, and GWT is another Google technology, as you may know. I uh, have no shame in admitting, this is my personal opinion, not the opinion of my company, that uh, I, I hate GWT. It's, um, it, it's, it's absolutely just shockingly frustrating to work with on a day-to-day -day basis, at least in the context I was dealing with it, which is a large um, legacy system that had loads of dependencies, very complicated build structure, and so on and so forth. So we wanted something new. We want something really, really fast to iterate on. And AngularJS kind of gave us the sales pitch, which was, well, OK, write AngularJS, and we will give you declarative in some sense. Basically, you will be able to write what you want, and you know, Angular will do the right thing. And like, well, OK, that's probably too good to be true. And given that we started using Angular before v1, it was true. Angular before v1 was a little unpleasant. Um, was, is there anyone here who used Angular pre-v1? No, OK, so it, well, it was not fun. Um, but basically, the intent is, you know, if you want a Hello World program, uh, if you want a Hello World web app, you know, you, you can just write Hello World. As you start to introduce, you know, functionality on click and so on and so forth, you get, well, the typical way of approaching this is by, you know, having some part of your business logic that attaches all of the event handlers from this part to that part. And so, you know, maybe you set up your own event system and it'll, there's a lot of wiring code and, and, and this sort of stuff that's absolutely horrible. 
So Angular's idea is, okay, well, how much of this can we remove? Let's just see how we got time. So, okay, I'll, I'll, I'll just start talking. Uh, we'll see how far I can get. Um, I guess Chris will kind of catch me up when, when I run out of time. But I want to give you a few examples of what this means in practice by using actual examples of, of Angular. Now, I've pulled these directly from the AngularJS uh, like main tutorial on the website. So. Um, if you are interested in using AngularJS after this, you can just hop onto the website and see exactly the stuff I've been talking about with a bit more context. You can run it in the browser and actually play with it. So um, this is how you get started with Angular. Uh, we've got a uh, ng app. Uh, can everyone see my cursor? Yeah, OK. So we've got an ng app thing here, and we've got a script which imports angular.min.js. So angular.min.js is just the script which, which does the thing. Um, when uh, the script uh, attaches a onload handler so that when the page is finished loading, it finds the element which says ng app, and then it runs through the page. And basically, uh, it looks for Angular declarations and things like this and acts on them in whatever way is appropriate. So this is kind of its bootstrap, which lets it, you know, uh, perform really deep kind of operations directly on the HTML. And so you see a couple of examples of this um, in the page I've got supplied. So you see this ng model. Uh, ng model basically says, okay, well, take the value of this thing and throw it into a variable. Now, the variable um, is available in JavaScript. We'll get to that in a second. But basically, what we've done here with ng model equals your name, and then uh, double, we're saying assign this thing to a hidden variable called your name, and then display it in this other thing. And all of a sudden, so you can see in the top right, I've got the um, application and what it would look like. You, as you type in the text box, Angular picks up on this and changes the value of the uh, header that's sitting below it. Um, now, it's got kind of this eval loop that's running in the background. Um, and so basically, every time you change the text box, Angular will pick up on this and update its internal state and then update the header. So all of a sudden, you've got something which would normally have required hooking up at least a couple of event handlers in order to do it properly. And you've got it without even going into JavaScript. So I haven't written a single piece of JavaScript yet. Angular just has hooked up all of the event handling for us. So that's really cool. So let's go to a more complex case. So obviously you want to hook up like deeper JavaScript in the uh, it, it, deeper JavaScript logic. Uh, so what can we do? OK, well, let's introduce this idea of a controller. Now, how many of you are familiar with the idea of an MVC pattern? Yeah, OK, almost everyone. So um, Angular uses a form of MVC pattern. Every web framework that claims to use an MVC pattern has a slightly different version of it, which is unfortunate. Um, but here we go. So some of this is familiar. Um, ng controller basically says, OK, well, I've got this JavaScript thing that has my business logic. And I want to hook this business logic into parts of my DOM. Um, and then at various points, so you can see this remaining block, um, we'll call um, these named functions that are exposed by our controller. Now, we don't need to set up any event handlers. Angular just says, oh, OK, well, remaining is declared on the controller and calls into it accordingly. Um, so you can see various things there. There's todos.length. So todos, again, would be a, a data object that's defined on the controller. Um, and then there's a few in other interesting Angular sort of, um, uh, I guess, syntactic sugar. So ng-click is where you start to see this kind of uh, uh, declarative event handling model. So ng-click equals uh, uh, archive says, OK, well, I don't want to hook up the event handler here. I just want to say what, what, what my behavior should be. So call archive whenever this thing is clicked. Um, under the hood, what it's doing, of course, is just doing your usual on click equals uh, call this function behavior that you've all done millions of times. Um, and the other interesting one is this ng repeat. So ng repeat equals to do in to do's. Um, so to do in to do's is just a little um, thing which says, well, it, it, so it's a for each loop. Um, except it's a for each loop which expands your DOM. So when you see an ng repeat, you will loop over this set of objects. So to do's is an object on your controller. 
you loop over the set of objects and for each one of those you produce one DOM element. So where we've got li ng repeat, we get one list item for each item in todos. So all of a sudden if you look up to the top right, you get a very basic to-do list app which updates as you um, change things. So if you update your, if you add a new to-do and click add, under the hood all you have to do is append it to the to-dos list and this will add it in the DOM without you having to do the back and forth event handling that you've all done millions of times before. So looking at, we get, um, so we get this dollar scope object. Now the dollar scope, I, if we have time, I'll get into a little bit more detail about it. It's probably the hairiest thing about learning Angular. F basically, it's a reference to um, kind of the data objects that you're allowed to manipulate. It, it's In some sense, it's your model. Um, the deeper thing about Angular is it's deeply tied to the DOM. So if we go back, um, and you see ng controller equals to do control, in some very direct sense, the scope represents this div. So you're passed in a reference to uh, the scope. Um, and here you see we actually construct the to-dos object with the initial things to do. And you see functions that manipulate the to-dos object. So scope.todos.push. Now the interesting thing is that at no point have we said, oh, now that I've pushed a new value onto the to-dos stack, update the view. Um, and nowhere have we said, Nowhere have we actually done the sort of formal um, event hookup aside from declaring it in our DOM. So you kind of get this eval cycle for f completely for free. Um, are people kind of happy with that? Okay, I'll take questions afterwards at any rate. Hang on, there we go. All right, so let's move on to something more advanced. So a Angular is kind of deep, you can use small bits of it and I've definitely done this for hooking up like ad hoc web apps so it's been very nice just to use basically the bits of Angular I've already shown you to hook up you know some sort of click events on uh, you know I was, t I was testing you know an idea or a prototype and all I did was was these things I've just shown you. Um, Angular also has a bunch of other things that kind of provide similar functionality to the sort of things you'd get from jQuery and so on. Um, and in addition, kind of flesh out this whole web development uh, ecosystem. One of the really appealing parts is the ability to define your own widgets in a really seamless way. Um, so I know one of the things that's historically frustrated me about jQuery is you often land in this pattern of like uh, when you want to create a new widget, you create a JavaScript function that says dollar, you know, quote div dot, you know, click something dot, you know, add style dot something dot something, and it's readable enough, but it's not declarative and it kind of leaves you with this kind of ad hoc um, mess of uh, things that's actually quite hard to test in a good way. Um, and part of the reason it's hard to test is because it looks like JavaScript and you want to do JavaScript testing on it, but it's actually kind of DOM manipulation code. So you really want to, you know, integration test it or kind of write uh, standalone uh, behavior tests. So. Um, so I'm going to talk about the way Angular does its, uh, uh, basically extends the language of HTML. So here you can see in the HTML, we've got uh, two new HTML tags. So we've got tabs and we've got pane. Um, so I'll get in, uh, in just a second, I'll get into how those are defined. Um, we've also got a small example of the kind of ad hoc functionality that Angular provides you with this ng, ng pluralize um, tag. So ng pluralize does exactly what you think it would do. It just takes two things and pluralizes them in the right way. Um, I'm not sure how it handles internationalization off the top of my head. Uh, for, the, for those of you who are writing web apps in multiple languages. Okay. Um, this is pretty hairy. Uh, I, the language that Angular uses to create widgets is very, uh, uh, very fully fledged. Like you, you can do a lot with it, but at the same time, it's quite unusual to get your head around first. Um, it's not particularly difficult. It's just odd. So, um, 
I've only provided the pane description here. Um, the tabs directive looks almost exactly the same. So what is this saying? I'll walk through it line by line. So require tabs. Um, this is really useful. What it means is that you can create widgets that depend on each other in a very meaningful way. And a really concrete example is, say you have a form. So Angular has form support as well, so this is, this is a little bit of a bad example in that way. But say you have a web form, uh, and you have an input widget as part of the web form. Uh, now, uh, say if I pick something near and dear to my heart, it's an address input. Uh, you need the uh, line one of the address to be aware of the other lines in the address because maybe you want to send off the address for the whole address for validation to the server every time you update the address. So uh, when you update line one, you want some sort of global context to update as a result of that. So what you would say if you'd build a special uh, uh, widget for maybe the, the postcode, you'd build the widget for the postcode, but you'd say, well, I need, to be the, I need this to be in the context of an address so that I can update. Okay, so that's require. And what it means is that if you go back, you can, is that my time? Okay. Um, <laughs> Couple of minutes. Okay, cool. Um, so what this means is that you can uh, actually reference things in the outside context with the address. Restrict E is just basically what how you can declare these things. Um, you see, we've declared them as HTML tags. That's what E means. There's also a bunch of other things that let you declare these things as um, data attributes or things like that if you want to be completely standards compliant and not just uh, declaring weird tags. Oops. Transclude. Um, basically means you can include the inner HTML of your, uh, of your widget. So if we go back a little bit, you'll see that the pane it actually includes some inner HTML in there. Uh, now when we expand out the pane widget, we want the inner HTML to be preserved. And the way you do that is by declaring a template and saying, here's where I want the original HTML in the new HTML. That's all that transcode means. Um, it's very useful in practice. Um, Scope then allows you to access different attributes of the widget. So um, in this case, pane title equals localization. Uh, you'll see that we now reference title in the context of the pane. And finally, there's template. Uh, now I want to, link is an interesting one. Um, I don't want to go into more detail because we're running short on time, but basically if you want to get really deep under the covers and sort of do um, some interesting stuff, and, and we've done this uh, in, in our application, you actually have a lot of control over what happens in the process of Angular processing your um, your element. So there's three separate phases that Angular will go through um, as it processes your element and during these phases you can do things like update some JavaScript state or have your, um, have your uh, different parts of your widget manipulate different parts of your model if, if you so desire. Um, in practice this isn't as useful now that they've got this cool templating thing but it's very powerful if you do actually get there. Um, Okay, so uh, there's, I was going to say a little bit about how it works. Um, I'm going to skip over most of that because we're short on time. Uh, if you want to come and talk to me afterwards, um, it, it does get very interesting in terms of the, the compiler passes, how Angular makes sure it's actually efficient during all of this stuff. Um, uh, the one thing I will say is uh, Angular has a steep learning curve relative to other similar web development frameworks. Um, so it's a little tricky to get your head around. I mean, and this is Angular's failing, but it's worth it in the sense that once you've learnt the uh, kind of way that Angular expresses itself, then uh, it's a very powerful and yet um, flexible system for building web apps. Uh, so I highly recommend you give it a look. Um, thanks very much. So we do have some time for questions, but uh, uh, we've got seven minutes till the next presentation. So if like in a couple of minutes you can swap laptops over, that'd be great. Are there any questions for Daniel on Angular? Yep, so you first, then you. Um. Yep. 
I uh, just wanted to ask if there are any, any projects in particular you wanted to call out that are actually using Angular? Um, so the most major one is uh, the uh, double click uh, interface, I believe, is now entirely built on Angular. I think it's entirely built on Angular. So double click is the big display advertising thing at Google. Um, Angular is still fairly new, so but there's more and more stuff coming out every day. That's but the double click one is probably the biggest and most notorious one. Can you do the very quick like thirty seconds? How does it and slash when does it actually run all that code to update? Um, okay, so oh, uh, the. Uh, so Angular basically during its initial compiler pass, it finds the elements which it's interested in in some sense. So, oh, I've put my slides away, I'm sorry. Um, each, uh, so each element it's interested in will trigger an update to Angular's model under the hood. So in some sense, Angular during its initial compiler pass kind of hooks in these uh, event handlers for you. So that's how it gets the sort of on-click behavior hooked up. Um, and then for the model update behavior, um, it's a little interesting. There's, uh, there's a few ways of doing it, depending on how, uh, how, how involved you're getting. For basic model stuff, like what I've just shown you, Angular basically, every time there's uh, a meaningful update, it re everything um, and then spits it back in, which is, to me, at first, sounded incredibly naive. Um, but it turns out it works really well in practice, which surprised me a lot. Um, the downside is in browsers which don't have a good JS engine, um, specifically IE7 and before, um, Angular underperforms. Are there any other questions for Daniel? Uh, yep, so you, then you. You said something right at the end which uh, I missed about standards compliance, which may be the answer to the question, but you've just stolen pain from HTML itself and from every other JavaScript library I might want to use. Can I use namespaces if I want to? Is there an alternative syntax? Can you address any uh, of that? So namespaces specifically. It's namespaces. Uh, oh, I'm oh, um, sorry. Uh, yeah, Angular does have support for that. There's, there's four different ways of declaring cool. um, your uh, Angular widgets, um, and I can't remember all of the off the top of my head, but for the longest time we were using HTML namespaces. Uh, we actually moved off them in favor of data attributes um, because our internal lint checks threw a lot of errors when we were using namespaces. So, yeah, that's, that was just us. How easily can you integrate um, service end events into the models, either through oh, web okay. sockets so, or... so something I didn't get to Talk. Angular has uh, kind of this stack sitting behind the DOM. Um, so at the model level, it, it's implemented using this thing called services. Um, so services are basically just singleton objects uh, created on the web app basis. Uh, so singleton for your web app, uh, which basically hook in things like um, uh, service end events, server server events and, and things like that. So uh, things like XML, HTTP, or request are implemented as um, a service. So Angular has support for a bunch of these different ones. I haven't come across one yet that um, I've really missed. Um, yeah. OK, uh, so okay. that's it for questions. Uh, everyone, please thank Daniel for his talk. Okay.